He revolutionized the art of batting. He was the first to bring cricket to a mass audience. He was generous of spirit and often controversial. Already a giant of the game before his first test match, Dr. William Gilbert Grace is one of ESPN's legends of cricket. the Grace Gates were erected at the members' entrance to Lords as a tribute to cricket's first truly great player, W.G. Grace. When you walk into Lords and you've got you know, the Grace Gates there, that, that tells you about the history of, of W.G. Grace for me. We, we see very old film of him playing. It's, you know, the game moves on. His record was a great record for England. The age he was playing cricket as well for, for England. Um, and that, that is it for me. You know, the history of his name is forever you know, synonymous with English cricket. Anyone who stands out as much as W.G. did against a lot of other players who were regarded as very good he pulled some of those uh, other players out and said, oh, gosh, he was a great player, that fellow there. WG was twice as good. So that's the benchmark. He was, if you like, the father figure of cricket. Um, he was really, the, well, he, he was. He was the first superstar of the game. The first man to score 100, 100 first-class hundreds, apart from anything else. But he was also the first man who really broke the mould for Victorian cricketers. He, Quite apart from the fact he was the most recognisable cricketer of all time, I mean, probably that probably still stands now, even in this era when when every every big player is splashed across billboards all over the place. But he, you know, with his beard, he was he was the second most recognisable man in Victorian England after Gladstone. Um, only Queen Victoria possibly had a bigger profile than either of them. The significance of Grace is that he made cricket into a popular game because he was the number one and the first and remains to most of us, I think, the greatest hero in the story of cricket. The theory and practice of modern batting owe much to Grace's thinking and working on the game. He was the first person to really apply technique to the art of batting. I think he, probably the first man in cricket history to really think about batting. He was very much a thinker on the game um, and credited with the introduction of the back foot technique and, and the front foot technique uh, and uh, having the uh, bat relatively close to the pad. Grace was very much the man who was regarded as bringing in those, uh, those nuances of technique. Um, and um, I suppose if you were going to have a coaching manual written in the late 1800s or the early 1900s, it would be W.G. Grace who would be the man who would write it. Grace was also a skillful bowler. Grace was a, an outstanding bowler. He was um, one of the best bowlers of his time um, and took a, a, an enormous number of wickets but that more reflected the amount of cricket that he played. Um, but a very crafty bowler. Um, and a, a bowler who by all accounts would do anything to get a wicket. Obviously a great, great character. Uh, a huge man uh, imposed himself upon the people who played the game. And obviously was the foundation of, of, of cricket. Grace was strong and athletic standing tall at the crease. He was neither a stylist nor a slogger. The first great batsman who timed the ball beautifully was perfectly balanced so that when he hit the ball he hit it for four uh, without having to slog and played very straight, played within the V, was a very intelligent cricketer. His very physical appearance was so imposing. Six foot two, the beard, uh, he was once actually quite a slim man. He was one of the champion athletes of England. He's visualised normally as a very plump and uh, self-willed man, but the self-will was part of WG. It's ma it made him the champion he was. I've actually played cricket with people who played with WG Grace, and, and he was special. I mean, they were only young fellows when he was in his dotage, and with his great big... You've got to remember, in his youth, he was a, he was a runner, a pretty decent athlete. I mean, we're talking about somebody a bit special here. I think 
Grace is really the preeminent cricketer of all time because he, uh, it was said uh, that they called him the champion, that the, the champion made modern cricket. Um, he, he took all the skills and synthesised them into sort of one whole and became the first complete cricketer. I don't think anyone's been more influential on cricket than Grace, uh, a great cricketer and, and, and a great advertisement for the game. When Grace made his first-class debut in 1865, cricket was a vastly different game to the one we enjoy today. When Grace started in first-class cricket, it was basically a pastime for the, uh, the upper classes. And Grace, by his great ability and being reflecting the times as sport became more something, uh, something for the masses, Grace turned cricket into a sport for ordinary people. Um, and he became the, uh, uh, something of a folk hero. A year after his debut and still just 18 years old, Grace scored his first century, 224 not out for England against Surrey. Absolutely remarkable. An early indication of W.G. Grace's uh, all-round abilities as a sportsman came in 1866. He was 18 years of age and got 224 not out for England against Surrey and then hightailed it across London and took part in a quarter mile race at Crystal Palace and won that as well. He really was an all-round sportsman, champion runner, champion cricketer. He played rackets, he played tennis, uh, and of course he qualified as a doctor as well. Grace finished the 1866 season second on the first class averages, making 581 runs at an average of more than 52. He would go on to top the first class averages 10 times between 1868 and 1880. For a very long time he was easily the best player uh, playing cricket, but by miles he dominated the game. He got a thousand runs I think in um, 28 seasons. Um, he also got 100 wickets seven times, I mean people forget that he was actually quite a useful bowler as well. And, and as a character, of course, he, he, he dominated the game as well. I mean, he, he was cricket. He was the fam probably after Gladstone, he was the most famous Englishman of his time. The following week, on the day his wife produced their second child, Grace made 400 not out, batting against 22 fielders. Grace had to play against teams of 15, 18 and 22 because in those days, on his first tour of Australia, that was basically all the games, when his first tour of Australia in 1873-74, he was playing against teams of 15 and 18 and 22, and he was scoring hundreds, 200s, and one day famously a 400, and he had to do that just by picking gaps. And the 400 he scored, he did that against a 22, on, a, on an outfield that apparently was very long grass. So he basically had to run every one of those 400 runs. I mean, this is a bloke who was clearly very, very fit, and as well as being very, very gifted. In 1873, W.G. Grace embarked on the first of two tours of Australia. Both trips were financial successes, but Grace was at times unimpressed with the colonials. He didn't enjoy having to travel to some of the um, country locations, which in a sense were, were a long, long way out of town and they were very arduous coach to us. And he writes not so lovingly about some trips to places like Swan Hill. And, and then he was playing against teams of 15, 18, 22 on some very, very ordinary wickets. And he talks in his autobiography of actually having to teach Australian groundsmen how to prepare pitches. I think the English attitude to Australians, uh, uh, I think they looked down their noses at Australians a bit in those days, or even more than they do now, and uh, I'm sure that would have upset, you know, they probably wouldn't have been used to being barracked, uh, and reacted, no doubt, the wrong way. Grace, the captain, was reviled in Australia, and some of the, um, he got into some, some ridiculous blues with um, uh, umpires, he basically called an umpire a cheat in one game, uh, though, though he denied it. Uh, he 
uh, even to the point he, uh, in Tasmania, he refused to bowl his bowlers because he felt the pitch was too dangerous. Uh, in Adelaide, he refused to use, let the Australian captain toss the coin with the coin that he wanted to use, which can only be by implication that he didn't trust the Australian captain. And he was painted in the press as being an extremely boorish and rude man. Though, interestingly, Grace sp speaks much more fondly of this second tour than the first tour. But I, I think it's uh, ironic that I think Grace was. Um, probably the first sporting hero in Australia to be deplored, to sort of play that villain role that uh, people like Jarb and me and Dad and Richard Hadley have played, and both of them to a degree, um, you know, a hundred years later, but Grace certainly had that role in the 1890s. Most agreed that Grace bent rather than broke the rules. He played hard and was perhaps the first to demonstrate the level of intensity that has become an essential element of modern cricket. Yes, when you look back at all the stories of W.G. Grace and how he bullied umpires, bullied opponents, he used to bluff batsmen out, he used to talk to them, he was a sledger, um, you think, well, more fool them. More fool them for falling for it. As a man, he was a giant. Uh, he was a, a very hard man to play, and the stories abound of, of his sharp practice and, and everything else. But. Um, and that's the way of the game, but I think of the people I've spoken to, and, and my first coach was uh, the former England wicketkeeper EJ Jim Tiger Smith, who started playing at the very end of WG's career, and Tiger always said to me, never mind who decries him, never mind they say he averages 31 or 32, he is the number one. In England, Grace was the most famous sportsman of the day, and alongside Prime Minister William Gladstone, the most famous Englishman. Crowds flocked to see him. He was box office. He was the person that the crowds wanted to go and see. Uh, and an example of that was a notice outside the ground, uh, three pence if, uh, for, for admission if Grace isn't pay playing, six pence if he is. Um, that really is an indication of, of the pulling power that the man had. He was the... Um... Uh, the best-known figure in England of his time, uh, politics and all, everyone knew who W.G. Grace was, and that did wonders for the game. There's the a famous story, possibly apocryphal, but it, it sums him up perfectly. The, the occasion when he was bowled by some young, uh, young thruster, and he picked up the bales, put them back on, said, the, the, the people here have come to see me bat, not you bowl, sir, and carried on batting. Uh, it was true. People paid good money to flock to see the doctor play cricket, and uh, the doctor took, uh, took home a fair amount of money for, for a supposed amateur. <laughs> By the time Grace played his first test match in 1880, he was already 32 years old, but he was still England's finest cricketer by a long way. He made the first ever test century in England, 152 at the Oval. His career really was pre-test cricket. He was, uh, his career was gentlemen v players. That was where he really made his name. Test cricket came along in really late in the day. He was still good enough to score the first test century in England in 1882. In fact, the, the, the series in which the Ashes was born, he, was, he scored a, a 150 in that match. So even late in his career, he was a, a good enough batsman to get big runs. But um, test cricket really uh, was something that he dabbled in right at the end rather than build his, his, his legacy around. I think he played test cricket up to the age of about 50. In those days, of course, there were no sliding saves on the boundary and no one-day cricket. So uh, one has to bear in mind that it was a completely different type of game in that sense uh, than the one we see in the modern era. Um, so from that point of view, um, it was possible for players who weren't perhaps at their physical peak to play the game, which allowed certain players to stay in the game longer. But Despite that fact, you still had to score runs, had to put runs on the board, and, and he was able to do so um, even into his 50s. Perhaps the best measure of the greatness of W.G. Grace as a cricketer can be taken from the traditional gentlemen versus players fixtures played between amateur gentlemen and professional players. The gentlemen v players game was the, the number one game of the English season. Uh, 
worked, certainly in the years before Test cricket. And even when Test cricket started, I think as far as status went, the gentlemen v players was the, the number one game. Uh, in a sense, it basically involved the, the gentlemen being the amateurs against the players who were the professionals. And uh, so they, this represented the absolute cream of, uh, of English cricket. And in the years before Grace came on, the, the players held the upper hand. But Grace as a gentleman then came in and just his record in gentlemen v players cricket is quite extraordinary. In the 19th century really they were the bedrock of, of English cricket and uh, they were bigger than test matches. They only appeared in 1877 right at the end of the end of the century um, and Grace really made them their, made them his own for 20 years. He was he was over 50 when he played his last one in 1899 and uh, he, he just bossed them like uh, no one has ever bossed uh, a particular form of fixture before and the irony is that he was an amateur he, he played for the gentleman against the players when in actual fact uh, and to call WG Grace a gentleman is is an absolute travesty despite his amateur status Grace profited considerably from cricket he was well paid even when he represented the amateur gentleman against the players he always kept on the gentleman against the players, but uh, he was about as much an amateur as any of our present-day professionals are, because he had two uh, enormous testimonials years, each of which then, back in the 1880s, 1870s, amounted to over £10,000. Well, that's what, what £20,000 add up to today, three million, four million. So he was a pretty shrewd old doctor, and I don't think he did much doctoring, but what a player. I think he was as near as makes no difference a professional cricketer, really, for the, for, for the time when he was playing the game. I mean, he certainly charged a very large fee to go as captain to Australia, um, and Lord Sheffield, I think, coughed up most of that. Uh, but he, yeah, so he knew his worth, certainly, and I should think he made at least as much out of his cricket as he did uh, out of his uh, surgery. In a sense, a long way away ahead of his time, in the sense that he realised that, you know, he was the number one figure. He was entitled to be well paid for that. And uh, he also, I think, realised that he had, he was an entertainer. And, he, and he, he, one of his obligations was to entertain the people who came to see him play. What he was good at, as an amateur, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, he was marvellously good at making huge dollops of money for himself. I mean, you know, W.G. Grace, the amateur cricketer. Grace retired from Test Cricket in 1899 and from First Class Cricket in 1908. His final recorded game at any level came a week after his 66th birthday, when he made 69 not out. Some of the figures, uh, which are astonishing, I mean he was still playing for England, he was still opening for England at 50 years of age. He scored 166 for London counties the day after his 56th birthday. So he was amassing all these amazing number of runs. When he retired, he was apparently barracked in that final test, the, the first test of 1899, for, his, for making some misfields. And when they asked him after the game why he'd retired, he said because the ground's getting too far away. The implication being that it just, just tested him to try to bend down that far. But even then, that was 1899, he went on to, uh, was still playing first class cricket in 1908. And uh, near the end of his career, um, he actually retired when he was 93. And someone said, well, what did you do that for? And he said, well, that was only scored between one and 100 that he'd never made. Um, and in his last season, in the, he scored, he was scoring prolific, not prolifically, but was scoring, was still a very effective run maker uh, in his final season in 1908. And to think, you know, at that stage, he was 57 years old. William Grace died of a heart attack in 1915 during the Great War. It was a very sad and poignant moment, not just for cricket, but for England. Of course, such a well-known cricketer dying at a time he did midway through the Great War when so many young men were being killed in the fields of Flanders. It was a, a great tragedy and was mourned widely across the country. From 1865 to 1908, W.G. Grace made 54,211 runs at an average of 39.45. He made 124 centuries. 
Between 1868 and 1876, he made 54 first-class centuries in England. No other player made more than 10. He took 2,809 wickets at an average of 18.14. He took 876 catches and affected five stumpings. He took nine test wickets at an average of 26.22. He played 22 test matches, scoring 1,098 runs at an average of 32.29. His batting average is clearly not a true reflection of his talent or his achievement. For me, he's number one, WG, because I don't think there's been a man other than Bradman who has, who's been so far ahead of all his contemporaries under conditions which were by far the most difficult to bat in this country. They've got better and better and easier and easier as the years have gone on. But in those days, when he started, I don't think there were any six hits. The overs were four ball overs, so the bowlers stayed fresher. Um, the pitches were absolutely unspeakable at times. The, the Lord's pitch inspector nowadays, he'd be working overtime then. And despite that, he did everything he did, 2,000 wickets and 50,000 runs and 100 hundreds, at a time when the game was, you can't quantify how many more times difficult it was for a batsman to do what he did. He was the subject of countless cricketing stories, some exaggerated over the years, many of them true. I, I love the story where he's out there batting and someone bowls him and knocks the bail off and he just turns around, picks it up and says, carry on bowling, they've come to see me, not you. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, magnificent, I said, it'd be nice if we could all do that. It's interesting, in the, the famous test at the Oval in 1882, when uh, which Australia ended up winning by seven runs and led to the birth of the Ashes. There was a very con controversial run out in Australia's second innings when their, their young batsman, um, Sammy Jones, uh, after completing a run, it was a wet tr track and he went down the wicket to do a bit of gardening. And Grace, as again as Fackler has it, hid the ball behind, behind his beard, but certainly whatever, snuck in and took the bails off and appealed for a run out. One day when bowled, he, he quickly put the bells back on and said, bit windy today, I'm buying them. I said, yes, I hope it doesn't blow your cap off on the way back to the pavilion, Doctor. What is impossible to dispute is Dr. W.G. Grace's contribution to the game of cricket. I suppose you could say he was the father of the sport and helped it grow, started to make it grow. Um, and because he was such a larger-than-life character, W.G. Would, was, was always going to be um, this is how English cricket started. He was the man that, that pushed it on, and he was the man that sort of gave it the lifeblood, if you like. Of all the champion cricketers honoured in this series, Grace is the most difficult to rate. His greatest years came before Test cricket began. Had he played today, he would have been as famous as Shane Warne, as tough and successful as Steve Waugh. He would have been a box office sensation but it is primarily for his massive contribution to the game in its formative years that Dr. W.G. Grace has an honored place amongst ESPN's Legends of Cricket.